and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, one of my favorite things to do uh, as a pastor is to get to counsel people. And one of my favorite things about counseling is getting to work with couples. Couples are an interesting group because by the time someone comes to a counselor, uh, if they're a couple, the problems have probably already been there for quite some time. Uh, and you get an opportunity to kind of dive in. And so when we, we discuss the problems that often bring someone into my office, um, what you usually get first is a, a rehearsal of the things that are going on. The, yeah, like he does this, and when he does this, I get frustrated. And, and he'll say, yeah, and when she gets frustrated with me, she says this, and then you know there's this thing going on, and that frustrates me. And, and this kind of round and round cycle often happens. Um, we see how pain and frustration is, is given from one partner to the other and, and how this, this kind of vicious cycle plays out. It's, it's interesting that as we do this and as you kind of dig in deeper, it's almost like a microscope gets put down for like the problems in the relationship. It's like we can see the, the littlest things that are going on with the other person and we can can lose sight of, of who they are and, and what's happened and why we're in the relationship in the first place. And at some point, one of the questions that I'll ask almost every couple as we kind of get into this like cycle, because you need to do it, you need to find out what's going on. Um, one of the questions I ask is, why did you fall in love in the first place? What made you want to be with this person? And and if, if we are honest about asking that question, it's, it's amazing how that slows down that process because it forces us to kind of sit back and be like, oh yeah, there, there was a way in which we once engaged that was different than now. And as we've d dived into all of the problems that we've had in our relationship, that the love that we've had for each other has grown cold, um, that we've we've sort of lost sight of some of those things. And as we begin to ask that question, it's amazing how people are able to, to look beyond the problem itself. It doesn't go away, by the way. Um, but they can have a hope that there might be something that can be recaptured in that process. Well, our text today isn't really so different um, as we look at the Ephesian church um, the, the church in Ephesus, the letter that we had heard Marshall read, is really, really good at figuring out what is wrong in the church and what is wrong with what is going on around them. They're a church that's really good at telling you what they hate, but you kind of get the picture that they may have lost what it means to tell you what they love and what it means to love. And I wonder if we sometimes find ourselves doing the same thing. You know, we can point out all the places that people around us are wrong. Perhaps they hold the wrong political position. Um, perhaps they support a bad cultural or social agenda. Or perhaps they even hold a major theological position that you disagree with. All these things that happen can drive a wedge between our love for one another, how we relate to one another, and ultimately our witness to the world. And it's at that point that we need to remember what it means for us to love each other and for us to love others outside of the church. And what I hope that we're gonna to learn today is that when we find that our love for others is growing cold, that the first thing we need to do is remember the love that Jesus offers to us as he dies on the cross and the love that he had when he called us to himself and how that love will change the way we love others. As we remember the, the love that Christ has for us, the outflow of that is the love that we then have for others. And we're gonna look at this from three perspectives. We're first gonna look at the story in Ephesus. This is Ephesus. <laughs> uh, second, we're gonna remember, uh, we're gonna talk about why it is that we have to remember our first love as we think about what it is to live in the church. And then secondly, or lastly, we're gonna remember our first love as we think about what it means to engage with the wider world. 
Because ultimately the way in which we love each other and the way in which we love others is a picture of our witness of Christ to the world. And so before we dig deeper into our specific text, uh, let me focus on a few things that we should understand about this next section of Revelation. Um, Chapters two and three, which will be on for like the next two and a half months. (laughs) Lots of letters. That's just chapters two and three. Um, We get seven letters that are part of John's vision and each one of those is written to an individual church. And so here's some things that we should be aware of as we look at this. The first is, is that they all start off with some sort of reference back to the vision that John had at the end of chapter one. That's been about two or three weeks now since we actually looked at that passage, but the picture of Jesus there is, is this picture of, of Christ in glory. You know, he's got fire in his eyes, a sword coming out of his mouth. He is holding stars in his hands. Um, the picture here is not just a man standing there, but this is the fullness of Christ in his power and in his glory. And each one of these letters is gonna pull those themes back in. And some of those themes are used to actually explain what happens in the letter. Like what is, is the, the, the letter about? So for example, our text today speaks of the one who holds seven stars and walks among the seven lampstands. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means and what that looks like. But those are keys to understanding the letter. Also, since Revelation is a full book, each one of these letters, right, is, is probably gonna get read by the different churches. So, you know, like some of the folks that probably have a a slightly harder letter to read, everyone gets to know your mail. Another thing that is that they usually start with some sort of commendation. There's one or two places where they don't, but as, as Jesus addresses each one of the churches, he wants to say, this is a place where I am thankful for you. This is a place where I am happy about you. This is a place where you are doing what is good. Most of them, not all, will then have some sort of condemnation. While you're doing well here, here is something that is a big issue and this needs to be addressed. And it always comes with a call to repentance because the beauty of God, right, is that he never really wants to point out our sin just to say, now, now here's your, you you rub in your dog's face and it's mess. It's, you've sinned, now what? Repent because there's always grace on offer to the churches. And finally, there's a promise to the one who conquers, to the church that repents, to the one that repents. And most of these promises either look back to chapter one again, or they're gonna look forward to something happening later in Revelation. The idea here is that these letters really are a a small portion of what it looks like to be a part of the whole book of Revelation. Now, when we look at these seven churches, it's also probably helpful to understand that these particular seven churches likely stand in for the whole church. Seven is one of those numbers in Revelation, which is a number of perfection, a number of fullness. Uh, and, and you could argue that the, the things that happen in this, these seven churches that we're gonna read about for the next month and a half or two months are probably the kind of things that happen in every church everywhere. And so as you look at each one of these churches, they're very specific to each individual church. But as we think about reading the book of Revelation today, the question that we should always ask ourselves is, how are we a lot like this particular church? Because these are the kinds of warnings that God would have for his church throughout all of history. And the call to repentance remains the same. The, prob- the reason we start with Ephesus is likely Ephesus is a port city. As you look in Asia, right, modern day Turkey, um, Ephesus is a major entry point into that area. And the seven churches are reasonably close um, and they might be on a postal route, but there are interconnected cities. They're cities that do a lot of, of business together. They're cities that are connected together. Uh, there are also some churches that are reasonably sized. Uh, and so as you look at these churches, it's like it would make sense that if you're gonna drop a letter off in Ephesus, that if you're gonna talk about other churches, you probably pick the ones nearby. And so as Jesus is kind of building this picture of what it means to challenge his church to stay steadfast in the midst of persecution and in the midst of a world that is actually against them, 
that these seven churches are just a picture of what it means to be part of the whole world, to be part of the church that exists in Israel, part of the church that exists in Syria, part of the church that exists in Rome, all the way around the the known world at the day. So with that said then, let's dig a little bit more into what's happening in Ephesus, because there's a lot going on in this text. Verse one tells us that to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands. This vision of one walking among the lampstands is really, really important to this particular letter, this short little seven verse letter to Ephesus. You see, the lampstand is a a reference most likely to the lampstand that exists in the, the tabernacle or the temple in the Old Testament. Um, you might know it as the, the menorah. If you, if you if we think about you know, Hanukkah, the, the menorah there is a, a picture of that lampstand that would sit in the holy place of the temple. And, and its job was to provide light to the priests who were working in the holy place. The lampstand probably looked like a tree and the, the picture of, of this lamp, this light that exists there, um, it was to be lit at all times, is a picture of the light of God shining forth as his priests did the work in the temple. And if the light of God is shining forth, it, it means that there is life in Israel. There are blessings for God's people. It also, as a tree, is a picture looking back to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. This idea of the holy place in the temple or in the tabernacle is is actually another picture of Eden, the place where God's presence dwelt with Adam and Eve before they sinned. Um, God's presence sits in the temple. And so as this, this lamp is here, this tree is here, it is a picture looking back to all of the blessings of God that are available to his people. And as we move into the New Testament, this theme of of the light, uh, the lampstand, gets gets fleshed out a little bit differently. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, (coughs) Jesus says that you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden because of its light. (coughs) Sorry, I have a cold this week. The idea of this is that that the, the church, the people of God, shine forth the goodness of God to the world, that you can't hide that, that there's something about being God's people that should shine out who God is to all that are around them. And so when Jesus thinks of the church, he says that you are the light that God has casting out into the world. But that's not enough. Jesus also refers to himself as the light of the world. So this lamp, which only gives light in the Old Testament to the holy place, in the New Testament is brought out into the world and shines forth so that all of the world can see. It's this picture of God opening the doors of entrance into his kingdom, not just to this small group of people who are born to Jewish mom and dad, but to anyone and everyone who places their faith in Christ. And so one of the ways to understand the lampstands in Revelation 1 is to see them actually as being a, the church's witness of who God is and what he has done to the world around them. And there is a call to come to Christ in that. So after that, we get this, uh, this idea of Jesus then saying, in verses two and three, he offers a number of encouragements. He says, I know your deeds and your hard work and perseverance The idea here is that the church has has shown the fruit of repentance, right? They've repented, and in their repentance, their lives have changed. They have hard work. They've persevered for the gospel. They have persevered for Christ. He says, goes on to say, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've then gone on to, to test those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you found them to be false. The Ephesians seem to know what truth is. The Ephesians know the word of God. 
and they will not stand for false teachers. You know, it's really interesting that if you actually look back at the letters that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, there are a number of them. He wrote the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, but also First and Second Timothy were written to Timothy as he is in Ephesus. And one of the main themes in First and Second Timothy is this idea of test those who are false. Be aware of false teaching. And so one can say that the Ephesian church has done a really good job of taking Paul's words to heart. And not only that, they have persevered and endured hardships for Jesus' name. And in doing so, they have not grown weary. This is a church that they've suffered and they continue to stand for Christ. He has one more thing in verse six. He says, and you hate this group, the, the Nicolaitans or the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now this particular group was a small subset of Christians. We, we don't know too much about them and they didn't last particularly long, uh, but it would seem as though they are more and more conforming to Roman culture. Um, they're more okay with this idea of uh, taking part in perhaps the, 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 the temple kind of sexual prostitution ring that goes on in the major temple in, in Ephesus. They probably take part in other temple feasts and they probably do so in order to take part in the day-to-day life of Ephesus. This idea of being in ancient Rome is that you do these things as part of worship and life. And so they kind of want to have one foot in the Jesus world and one foot in the Roman world. And the Ephesians will have nothing to do with that. They're like, wait a second, this isn't what it means to live out the Christian life. We, we hate that. We're going we're gonna to get rid of that. We're going to excise that. We're going to call it wrong. You know, at this point, it would really sound like the Ephesian church is doing pretty well, doesn't it? Like this is what we would want a church to look like. We want them to know false teaching. We want them to call out false apostles. We want them to say, you are not living in accordance with what Christ would want. You shouldn't do that. They deal with persecution. And yet Jesus has one major issue with them. And it's not a small deal. Verses four and five tell us, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at the first. You know, it's interesting that that we talk about pendulum swings in life sometimes, right? Um, As the Ephesians think perhaps about all of the things that are wrong and all these things that need to be corrected and all of these things that they need to guard against, it is this idea, right? Almost like the couples that like microscopically look at what is wrong with the other person and kind of forget all the other things, that we swing the pendulum to finding all of the wrong things in everything that we see. And sometimes in doing so, we miss the love that we have for each other and the love that we should have for other people in that process. Because somehow as we swing the pendulum, we dehumanize the person and make it about the thing that's wrong. And so as Jesus sees them, he's like, you guys are really great at this part, but something is missing. And it's this idea of the love that you had at first or your first love, depending on your translation. And I think that, that there are three different options of how to, how to make sense of this particular statement um, because it's not particularly clear. Uh, The first of the possibilities is their love for God. And if this is the case, then what Jesus is saying is that you have forsaken loving God. But that doesn't really seem to fit with everything Jesus said about them. They seem to know uh, a lot about what it means to follow after God. They're obedient. Uh, They they suffer. They, They seem to care a lot about who God is and what's going on. And yet at the same time, sometimes we can focus it on those things and miss the love that that we would experience in Christ. But I don't know if this is the best explanation for what they talk about when this idea of their love at the first, because again, God seems to really matter to them. The second one is this idea that they have forsaken the love for each other that they had at the first. This idea, right, when, when we come to Christ, there's something 
something that happens that sort of changes our hearts, that all of the, the times that we might be frustrated with other people, um, we're able to like put that to the side for a little bit. Um, we just take joy in being united in Christ and we look at the church and we're like, hey, you guys are just like me. <laughs> you, you've been forgiven, you've been changed, you've been renewed. We can get along, we can take care of this. But over time, that sort of love can begin to fade. And if this is what Jesus means, then it looks like they're, they've gotten really good at detecting falsehood, but for all of their focus on truth, they've forgotten to love each other. This one actually makes a lot more sense in the actual text itself, because how easy is it for us to get stuck on our various understandings of the truth, our various understandings of scripture, our various applications of scripture, and only use it as a tool to push others away rather than to let the fact that we might disagree on things be something that forces us actually to draw together. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The third is perhaps that they've forsaken the love that leads to witness to Christ to the world that does not know him. Given what Jesus says that he will do to them if they don't re repent, this also seems very true as to what could be meant. Jesus says if they don't repent, in verse five, that he will take away their lampstand. Right, again, if the lampstand is this idea of, of their witness to the world, he says, I'm gonna take away your witness to the world. And that seems like a logical consequence, doesn't it? If they have, if they have stopped actually being a witness to the world, to the love of Christ, to say, well, Let's just call a spade a spade and we'll take it away. Um, that he says that here, if this is the case, then I will take away your ability to witness well. Now, personally, as I think of these three things, I think it's kind of a mix of all three, but mostly two and three. Um, and we'll, we'll look to how to apply that a little bit more um, as, we, as we walk this out. But what I want us to see is that as Jesus points out his issue with the Ephesians, you again get to see a church that is really good about talking about what they hate, what they have problems with, what's wrong, but one that is struggling with loving one another and the world. So what does this look like as we kind of try to take this and put this into a modern world? Because one of the questions we have to ask in every one of these letters is, how might we be like this church? And what might we need to repent of if we are? What are some of the ways that we forget to love our own fellow Christians, to love those within the body of Christ? In John's gospel, as Jesus is getting ready to suffer and die, he tells his disciples this in John 13. He says, a new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. It's a lovely statement. And yet, while Jesus talks about love with his disciples, the, the church of Christ has been fractured into hundreds and thousands of smaller groups, all of them defined by the things that make us different from each other. We circle around our own specific readings of the Bible and we defend ourselves in each one of those things. And in doing so, we separate from others who think differently and have less and less to do with them instead of actually saying, you are like us, you're in Christ, you're with us. We may disagree on some things, but what does it look like for us to embrace what it means to be united in Christ? Now, don't get me wrong, this is one of those asides I feel like you have to make anytime you talk about love and truth. Um, just like the Ephesians, it's very important for the church to have sound doctrine. Jesus didn't say to the Ephesians, hey guys, doctrine divides, but love unites. He commends their sound doctrine. It's a good thing that you are aware of these problems. It is a good thing that you are aware 
of how to engage the world and to call people uh, to a better life. Yet, somewhere in this, you have lost your love. Because the problem is, if you have sound theology, but it doesn't lead to loving one another, then your theology is not sound. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The famous chapter on love, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So for all of the gifts that the Spirit can give, right? The gifts were meant to unify the body and even now in the church, oftentimes spiritual gifts separate the body. We we separate over our understanding of some of these things. Paul says, right, these things are nothing without love for each other. Early in the Reformation, two of the reformers, a guy by the name of Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, fun name to say, met in order to see if they could join their two movements together. Um, They didn't start together. They weren't trying to do this together. Um, They both kind of came to some similar conclusions about some problems that were going on in the church and said, hey, can we join up, do this together? They drafted up 15 points that summarized what was important to their understanding about what needed to change in the church. And as you look at those 15 points, on 14 of the 15, they were in like perfect agreement. Now point 15 was separated into three subpoints. You can already see how this leads to problems, right? On two of the three subpoints, they were in full agreement. But on one, they could not agree. And in the end, Luther walks out says, we can't do this. We can't join together. They disagreed on this idea of how Jesus and communion work together. And you know what? That's an important point. And yet, these two men who the Lord is using to renew the church can't join together because they can't find a way to love one another through some of these places. How sad. I wonder if there's a way in which that impacted their witness and if that kind of splitting right off the bat in the Reformation is what led to, you know, the 500 to 5,000 denominations that we have in the world today. That we start off splitting and that's what keeps happening. Would we have less division if they were able to find a way through? I don't know. But you know what, we still do this today. I mean, I've been called a heretic by my own family because of some of my positions on baptism. When a watching world sees us nitpicking each other over secondary issues, they think that's what it means to follow Christ. Why would they want to enter that community? See, our lack of love toward each other, our lack of movement toward each other hurts our witness to the world. Another example might be how we deal with divorce. The Bible is pretty clear that divorce is not usually God's plan A for marriage. And what is considered a good reason or a a possible reason for divorce in the Bible is pretty narrow. It's usually adultery or some form of abandonment. But the world's a really messy place. And sometimes those two things are not abundantly clear. I've heard a lot of stories over the years about women who have been in marriages to men who've probably already abandoned their vows to their marriage in some form or another, whether it be through their anger and their harsh words to their wife and their children, whether it be through some kind of emotional manipulation, whether it be through their porn addiction. And oftentimes, because we value marriage, we want to say, you know, can you, just, can you just bear with him as the Lord does his work while he repents? Um, and if you just kind of submit to his leadership, over time we'll see what God will do. 
But what if he never does? And how do you care for someone who's already struggling in their own marriage by saying, well, if you just kind of wait it out, maybe it'll get better. Um, We're not necessarily working with this guy. We're not necessarily doing whatever. We desire to see, see the marriage stay together because the Bible says divorce is wrong. And I mean, he hasn't technically committed adultery um, and he hasn't technically abandoned you. So we, we don't wanna let you do that, right? We're, we're focusing on the, the right and the wrongness of it. But in the midst of that, we're missing that there's a way in which this particular woman in this case needs to be loved. Um, and, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but it might not be simply saying, so just wait and see. These are both hard situations because they're, they're real things at stake, right? Like in one, there's, there's two movements in the church and another, um, there's a marriage and, and these people want to care about what God says about these things. And they should. We should care what God says about these things. But how do we fight that tendency to excel at finding out what is wrong but lose our love for each other in the process? I think the answer is that we remember our first love or the love that we had at the first. Isn't meeting someone new to the faith just wonderful? I mean, I alluded to this earlier, right? But, but they're so excited about how much Jesus loved, loves them and how much he's transformed their lives. Um, you know, as Darren sometimes says, that some of the craziest things come out of their mouths. Um, but it's like, but it's glorious to hear the joy and that abounds and the way in which that actually outflows to others, that they, they move toward others in a way that shows that excitement uh, about having been loved by Christ. Where, you know, they're often more apt to pray for other people. Um, you know, they're more apt to serve one another. Um, it's just obvious as that happens, um, the love that they have for others. And, and there is this idea that over time, right, as we get into the day-to-day, as we get into the grind of life, that that, that can settle down. But to remember the, the work of Christ on the cross, the love that he has for us is something that reminds us of that transformation that he's already done in our life. And it points us then to the love that can flow out to others. We're gonna have disagreements about a lot of things in this church and in other, other bodies. But don't get lost in the fact that we're united to each other in Christ in the midst of our disagreements. And don't lose the fact that we are called to love one another in the process. And that that's actually part of our witness to the valley as we do that. You know, one of the things I love about this church is, is that we are a place that seeks to love well. We're not perfect by any stretch, but it's a desire and you see it. I've heard multiple stories this week of people visiting others in nursing homes, of meals being brought to struggling families, of people coming alongside others who are hurting and are struggling. And all of this is an outflow of the love of Christ for us toward those that he has put in our lives in the body of Christ. As we remember what it's like to be loved by Christ, I hope that we'll not only be good at pointing out false teaching, but loving our brothers and sisters. Now, the last thing that we should consider is what it means to remember our first love as we think of the world. If part of what is, is at stake in our passage is the church's witness of Christ to the world, how the church then loves the world matters. This text has a play between love and hate, right? Like they, the Ephesians have lost their first love. And yet the flip side is, is the thing that they're, that they're commended for is their hate for this group that is, is uh, so wrong in what they do. You see, everything that they hate is a good thing to hate. Their hate is proper, but in doing so, they've forgotten their love. And, and, and the question is, how are we guilty today? You know, one of the things that you hear today is that the, the church, at least in America, is more known for what it hates than its love for Christ and for others. Now, that may or may not be a fair statement. And sometimes when that's raised, it's raised because it's a smokescreen because we don't wanna deal with what it is that we're saying. But on the other hand, there's probably some truth to it. Um, As we look at the world and we see broken places and we call out those broken places, 
that seems to be a voice that we lead with as we look at the world. I mean, let's be honest, there's been a seismic shift in our culture for decades now. I mean, we could probably go back to the 30s, but we could definitely put it somewhere in the 60s, right? We can look at the, uh, the, the women's liberation movement in the 70s, the way that changed home life and sexual ethics that in the 70s and 80s gives, right, gives rise to the gay rights movement that climaxes and legalized uh, gay marriage in, in the early teens of the 2000s um, to what we're dealing with today in some of our gender debates. In each one of these, the first voice that's often heard when we think about these things is a voice of condemnation. We want to name what is wrong first, but in doing so, I wonder if we miss what it means to express love to individuals who are struggling. We say what the most, sometimes we might say the most loving thing is for people to know that they're in sin and to know that they need Jesus, and I wouldn't disagree. Uh, but is that always going to be the easiest way to express love? One of the amazing things about the Gospels is, is that Jesus was known and hated by the religious people, by the way, because the sinners like flocked to him, the prostitutes, the drunkards, the fist fighters, the people who wanted to overthrow the government, <laughs> all of them flocked to Jesus. They didn't go to the priests. They didn't go to the Pharisees. They saw something in Jesus that was good. They wanted to be around him. Now, mind you, Jesus is the one who's the judge of the universe. <laughs> And he knows that they're right and they're wrong, but there's a way in which he is relating to them that does not push them away. Like the Pharisees do when a woman comes into a Pharisee's house and she's washing Jesus's feet. And he's like, Jesus, if you knew what kind of woman that was, you would never let her touch you. And Jesus is like, of course I would, because I know what kind of woman this was. And I love her. And as Jesus offers that, right, he offers dignity to those people who are broken, those people who are in sin. He understands that they are made in his image. And if you're made in God's image, you deserve dignity. He doesn't start with, hey, you are wrong. He starts with dignity and care and love. And then he always ends with, go and sin no more. He cares about sin, but he offers dignity and care. And I sincerely wonder if, as we try to figure out how to navigate all of the social changes in our culture, if we are missing that aspect in our witness. I hear about the culture war from so many sides. I keep my, my fingers in all the different pools of water because I wanna see what the world thinks. And Christians are more than happy to sign up for service in the culture war. And often with social issues, we find that we put the behavioral cart before the gospel horse. That first we want to change the culture, then give them Jesus, as opposed to offering Jesus and letting him do the work to change. Because if the statistics are even close to correct, between 25 and 30% of the rising generations are gonna put them somewhere on the LGBTQ plus spectrum. They're one of those letters. 25 to 30%, that's a huge number. I think in time it's probably gonna fall, but I think it's still gonna be high. And that means that if we're looking to reach that particular generation, there's a good chance that we're gonna have to figure out how to engage them. How do you engage people for whom they, they declare an identity that may or may not be what we would call their actual identity? On the one hand, it'd be simple to pull out our best Charlie Kirk line or our Ben Shapiro line and be able to point out the logic of how one can't actually declare an identity. Um, we could make some sort of a joke about it and be like, see, you can't like declare that you're a coin. Um, but, <laughs> but what's the point of that, right? If we do that, is it to own? Say, oh, I owned you, right? No, we, we need to love. As we engage people with the gospel, might we start first with their dignity? Love tells us that they're created in God's image, however flawed. And apart from Christ, that they have no reason to change. Might we instead show hospitality and dignity first? And yes, then truth second. 
Because again, the Ephesians were really good at truth and I think we should be too. I think the antidote is for us to look at how our own love for others is shaped by the love that Christ loved us. When we understand that we were loved in spite of our own sin, that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us, that how we can then offer that to others. You know, we often say we hate the sin and love the sinner, but we start with the hate. I wonder if it would be that we should at least flip it, if not change it entirely and say, we love the sinner. And yes, we also hate sin. Because if we focus too much on what we hate, even if it's good, I think it leads to this idea of growing cold in our love toward others. See, throughout history, the church has been known to its, for its love of outcasts. One of my favorite stories is in the ancient Roman world, as pandemics would happen, you know, everyone would leave the cities because that's where all the people are. As everyone leaves, the church would rush in and they would set up hospitals and they would sit and they would die with people because they love those who are unlovable. There's another place where the poor were given dignity as they're given the opportunity to eat with aristocrats. They're all one in Christ, they're equal, they're level. Like this is what God's people were called to be. And the beauty of our passage is its conclusion. Chapter two, verse seven says, to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the language of Eden. This goes back to a time where God walked with his people and things were perfect. The lampstand that Jesus talks about is a picture of the light to the world that is the gospel, that is who he is. And it's brought back to the fore at the end of this. The tree of life is in the paradise of God. And for the weary Christian who struggles with the world that's shifting, for all the things that we have to figure out in here and, and deal with and work with, man, the garden paradise that God is going to bring back, a place where that will no longer be a problem, is an encouraging place. A place where we won't have to talk about loving one another anymore because we will. We won't have to talk about sin anymore because it'll be gone. This is a picture of rest and joy. Now it's my hope as we think about this passage that we can assess ourselves. And if we are deficient here at Redeemer and our love for one another and our love for those outside, that we would repent and that we would do so quickly. That we remember the love that was shown to us by Christ and that we would move toward others with that same love too so that we can look forward to tasting the fruit of the tree of life as Christ returns. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you loved us first, that we don't have to force something that has not been given to us, Lord, but even as you call the Ephesian church uh, to rekindle their love for each other and their love for others, Lord, that you would remind us to do the same. Um, but we know that all love that we have for each other ultimately comes from you. And so we look to you uh, to continue to lead us and guide us and show us what true love is, um, even as we see a picture of that every time we think of Christ. Uh, may your spirit be at work to convict us when we are in sin of not loving others and draw us to repentance and to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.